everyone. Welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. I'm Indre Viscontis, the Director of Communications. The Sound Health Network is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the University of California at San Francisco. And in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming. It is my great pleasure today to welcome you to this exciting panel on exploring app-based music interventions and therapist-led music therapy. Um, this particular panel was the brainchild of Dr. Asal Habibi, who's an associate professor uh, of, research, uh, of research and psychology at the University of Southern California. Welcome, Asal. So great to have you here. And I just want to let you know who the rest of our panelists are as, uh, as they come online too. So Dr. Melita Belgrave is an associate professor of music therapy at Arizona State. Dr. Edward Large is a professor at the University of Connecticut and also the founder and chief science officer of Asilo Biosciences. Dr. Frank Russo is a professor at Toronto Metropolitan University and the chief science officer at Lucid. And Dr. Matthew Sachs is an associate research scientist at Columbia University and also um, works for Spotify. Welcome all of you. Uh, I will let us all take it away now and give us an overview of why we're doing this panel. Wonderful, thank you, Andrea, and hello everyone. Uh, wonderful to be here. And thanks to the Sound Health Network for hosting this discussion. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a faculty of psychology at University of Southern California. And before I tell you more about the panel, I just quickly want to share a disclaimer that currently I'm a PI of uh, one of the music-based intervention apps that we're going to be talking about today, Lucid. We're running a clinical trial with Lucid at USC at my lab. Oh, I guess I should jump in and say I'm also involved um, with a company called Roboto uh, that does uses personalized uh, physiological responses to music to develop personalized playlists. So I guess we all have a a, a finger on the on the pulse. The pulse. Great. Thank you. So really, today's goal is to explore the evolving landscape of music-based interventions with a particular emphasis on techno intersection of technology and uh, traditional methods of uh, therapist-led sessions. Uh, we know that the, the technology is developing and we are having the luxury to be able to access personalized music uh, across kind of like broader demographics and in more areas that are usually not accessible, maybe just one-to-one -one personal music therapist. And we know that there is really different apps that provide um, traditional methods of listening to a playlist that is for focus or relaxation, but also really this technology has advanced to use AI to be able to use kind of mental and emotional states to suggest music and personalize music. We also are all um, recognizing that the role of a music therapist, the human interaction, the empathy that comes to the music sessions, and, and how things can be adjusted to the patient and client at a time when we have a human therapist who has experience and expertise involved. So really today, I wanted to have a discussion and, and all of us to talk about um, the avenues that these two can interact, uh, can coexist, one not replacing the other, but complement each other. So I really am excited to have all of you here to talk about your expertise and then we can take the discussion from there. Um, so let me start by using the questions to also have our panelists to introduce themselves a little bit and tell you about the specific work that they're doing. I'm gonna start with Frank. So Frank, you are the Chief Science Officer for Lucid, which is an AI-driven music-based intervention app. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Lucid, the work that's been done, but also maybe just kind of with the emphasis of how Lucid is addressing the uh, the need for accessibility of these interventions, for example, thinking about underserved communities or um, more remote areas. If you can unmute yourself. So uh, thank you for that, Asal. Uh, very broadly speaking, Lucid is trying to turn music into medicine. Um, our approach is to marry together insights from music therapy, music science, uh, with the power of AI to curate personalized interventions. That's the, the general approach. 
Our primary focus has been on anxiety and comorbid disorders. So uh, conditions like agitation and dementia, tinnitus, pain are in our sites. My role has been to coordinate studies with partners. Uh, I also work closely with the development team to develop new evidence-based modalities. Um, my view on what this is all about, like what is the utility here? How does it fit with music therapy? Uh, goes something like this. Uh, you know, if we take the U.S., there, I, I think our uh, we're currently at uh, a little over 330 million people. 31% uh, of those people are likely experiencing anxiety at some point in their lives. Uh, uh, so a conservative estimate would be that 100 million people may benefit from music therapy. We know that music therapy can mitigate anxiety and related problems. Uh, I looked it up and it seems that there are currently about 25,000 music therapists uh, you know, if we double, if we triple, if we quadruple the number of music therapists, we won't meet the, de the, the demand. Uh, there are some people who are just not comfortable seeing a therapist. And one way to think about these interventions is that they're a gateway. And maybe gateway is being used the wrong way here, but it's a comfortable way into taking care of yourself and thinking about your issues. Some people are, of course, living in remote locations where a music therapist is not available. And uh, more broadly, you, you know, you already touched on it, Asal, but I think that there's a real opportunity for music-based digital therapeutic, therapeutics to complement the good work that music therapists are doing with their clients. Great. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, that's uh, really great to put us into that context of what the need is and how, yes, music therapists alone probably can't meet this need unless we start turning them out in much, much, much larger numbers. Um, I do want to mention to those of you that are with us live on this webinar, we we deliberately chose to record this with you in mind as an audience so that you can ask questions. So if you're listening live, please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A section or in the chat. Um, and I'll be monitoring those and, and uh, bring them up to the fore as we go. Um, but Matt, you're a research scientist at Spotify. Spotify no, you know, is, is sort of built an entire company around personalizing music and suggesting music uh, for different you know, purposes and uses. So tell us about what you do at Spotify and you know, how, you know, how you approach this idea of personalization at this company-wide level. Sure, and thank you all for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm currently a data scientist in personalization at Spotify, and I was an, and still am affiliated with Columbia University as a research scientist and postdoctoral researcher where I studied more of neural response patterns to emotions. And now at Spotify, yes, the goal is always about how can we give listeners the music they might need in this moment without needing editors or doing this at a global scale across the world. So my team really works on the models that power a lot of these predictions. So there's kind of two that, if you go on the app um, now, you can start typing in things like focus or calm or anxiety, and you'll get a list of editorially curated playlists, which is not what I do, or specific playlists made exactly for you based on the music we know you like with a little bit of discovery thrown in there. You can all try it. There's an anti-anxiety mix if you want. There's a calm morning mix. These are all based on this kind of newer model that we're working on now that my team owns. And it's trying to basically map descriptors of music to our entire catalog. And then from there, we specifically uh, personalize it to you based on what, basically what your listening history is, what you've listened to in the past. So Spotify doesn't directly work with any sort of specific like mental health care app or any specific thing, but it kind of takes the approach that um, listeners know how to self-medicate with music. And as long as we can get them the music that's ideal for them or that their favorite music is, that's going to be helpful in sleep or focus. My personal take is that for most of these, um, the benefits of music, it's there's not, not, not going to be like a one-size-fits-all type piece that everybody's going to be able to allow them to focus or everyone's going to reduce the anxiety, but it's really super personalized. And so the goal here is, how can we know what a user is going to want in a given moment or a listener? Sorry, that's user is Spotify language and not person language. <laughs> um, the other efforts that we have coming up is 
um, something called Your DJ or AI DJ. It's kind of like a AI version of a disc jockey who walks you through your music history. Right now, it's very or kind of tells you like, hey, you know, we've noticed you've been listening to this. Right now, again, it's not geared towards it's not it's pretty primitive and it's not geared towards any actual goals. But what we're really trying to do is bring in much more contextual information. So where are you? We know in the mornings you typically go to the gym. So let's now surface you workout music in that without you having to tell us that you're at the gym. We know at four o'clock you ever you always try to take like a meditation or like a, a nap, for example. Let's try to give you that music. We're not very good at that right now, but that's the kind of goal of our team is to use what you do typically in the context to better serve the music when you might need it. Great. That's very interesting. So speaking of um, tailoring and personalizing music specifically to a goal um, and maybe a population, Ed, you've been working on this for a long time, as early as 2016 with the company Oscilloscape, that in 2020, it became Oscillo Biosciences. And uh, basically, it provides treatments for neurodegenerative diseases using both uh, synchronized light and music to stimulate rhythm. Uh, if you can share a little bit about the work of the company and your work and maybe any research trials that have been done, clinical or non-clinical, about the findings. If you can unmute yourself, too. Um, in 2020, yes, we started um, working on uh, basically, you know, music-based interventions, and we targeted specifically Alzheimer's disease. So um, as everybody sort of knows, neuro, uh, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative and ultra, ultimately fatal neurological disease. Um, uh, what we may not know is that Alzheimer's disease uh, manifests in part as a dyssynchrony of the brain rhythms that underlie memory and cognition. So what we want to do is we want to use the power of music, which is really unmatched in terms of synchronizing brain rhythms, and we want to supplement that with pulses of synchronized light to target specific brain frequencies and even specific parts of the brain um, that are important in memory and cognition. So it's it's music plus synchronized light pulses. Um, and we hope, you know, by doing that, we'll be able to take the, the power of music that, you know, some of us may have seen in, in, um, in short videos and so forth um, to sort of awaken Alzheimer's patients and make that into a more uh, long lasting kind of effect, right? So we're developing a device that is really just as simple as putting on a pair of glasses. Um, and users can choose their own music just by uh, speaking. Um, so they can say, play my playlist, or if they you know, have specific songs or perhaps a caregiver um, helps with, with choosing music. Um, and we so they're allowed to listen to their favorite music and then there's a neural network inside um it actually runs live in real time on the glasses so you're streaming from the web but you're running the neural network live and that neural network is simulating what's happening in the brain when you listen to rhythms in real time um and we use that to synchronize the lights to music so what we want to do is we want to target basically theta, which is sort of very fast, like eighth notes in the music, and gamma, which is a little bit faster, and theta gamma coupling. And those those are the rhythms that are really important um, in memory and cognition. So um, the patient can use it in their home. It's a comfortable wearable. Um, it's a, it's We think it'll be effective and scalable. Um, and it's it's well tolerated and doesn't interact with any pharmaceuticals. So um, that's important for us too. Um, I, I mean, in terms of you know why do we think such an approach might work? Uh, there have been a number of studies out there in which, for example, gamma frequency rhythms in mice and the hippocampus of mice, which is the memory area, are are synchronized uh, with direct um, brain stimulation in the hippocampus. Um, and those have shown improvements in uh, 5XAD mice, which are uh, genetically engineered to have Alzheimer's. Um, there have also been uh, transcranial alternating current uh, stimulation of uh, theta rhythms that have been shown to improve memory in older adults. So we're sort of piggybacking on those findings. Um, uh, the uh, Li Wei Tsai's lab at MIT has also shown that audio visual stimulation of gamma can have some, um, some strong effects. But you know we we see sort of a couple of challenges there. So one, you know, 
uh, gamma uh, gamma rhythms played auditorily are, are sort of highly aversive. Even the mice don't like them, it turns out. Um, and if you if you do visual stimulus alone, it just doesn't have the same effect. The neurons habituate very quickly, um, and it doesn't you know just doesn't have the same effects. Um, so what we've done, so what we do is we play music. So music naturally stimulates delta and gamma. That's like the rhythm of the music that you hear, and then it's also stimulating bursts of gamma activity, and that's what we try to synchronize with the lights: this theta and gamma and that phase amplitude coupling. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, we've done, so our, our trials are being run in Psyche Louie's lab, Dr. Psyche Louie, the, the mind lab at Northeastern University. Um, we've done, we did one big uh, sort of exploratory study where we looked at younger adults, older adults, um, and a few adults with Alzheimer's. It was still kind of COVID times when we ran that study. Um, and we're seeing, we see um, strong synchronization of uh, gamma, theta, and theta gamma phase amplitude coupling. Um, we also we're also able to show that synchronization to music is um, is just as strong in older adults as it is in younger adults. And there had been some uh, evidence to the contrary, but we used naturalistic music, and we could show that the effect was as strong in older adults. And right now, uh, Dr. Louis is running uh, additional uh, an eight week uh, intervention um, with. Uh, mild cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's patients. So I can't really report those results to you here, but we hope we'll have them in the spring. Well, that's really helpful. Thanks. Uh, and it sounds like there's a lot of really important and great work. And and I think, yeah, I think the whole gamma wave e excitement is is building in the, in the music as medicine space. Um, so we'll be curious to hear how that works out for a solo, um, but you're right. It's not the most pleasant tone <laughs> to listen to. <laughs> Um, you want to find so, a way to mask it if you can, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in uh, from our audience, but Melita, you're the music therapist in the group practicing. I know it's completely unfair of us for, you know, to, to have you represent <laughs> the entire field, um, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, but yeah, can you tell us specifically about your work, about how you use technology if you do, and maybe... Um, some of the reservations you might ha have regarding some of the uh, ways that the that that people think that music therapy can just be replaced by an app. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here, even though I'm the only music therapist in the group. Um, my area of focus in music therapy is older adults, so I would do a lot with the aging population, from wellness settings to end of life care. I specifically really enjoy working with older adults with dementia especially as they progress through the illness. And you know, a lot of just my work and learning about this population is the change that starts happening, meaning I need to change my interventions and the way I interact with the older adults. And so I end up using a lot of nonverbal communication. My guitar often is a barrier in stages when I'm working with individuals in late stage dementia. Um, I'm finding it takes a lot longer for them to recognize that I'm in their environment to be able to make music with me, those things look different. Um, and so taking my time in that space to work on engagement behaviors. And then I've done a lot of work with older adults in both intergenerational settings and lifelong learning settings. And my favorite to do in those is a lot of music learning. And we use a lot of music technology in those spaces. So I've had an iPod band before where we've worked with GarageBand and we learn how to play the instruments and we form a band and we perform. And um, one of the great things about doing that with it being music therapist led is that I can respond to the patients. I can respond to the clients. I can respond to the participants. So I can change so many of the music elements. We can change the genre if it's not fitting. I can change the tempo. I can change how many times we repeat it, right? Um, and so there's a lot of me teaching the older adults how to engage with their technology, or if we take MP3 players home to learn original recordings and things like that. So I'm excited about the conversation today because I am someone who believes that technology is very useful um, and that it can enhance what we do in our music therapy sessions, especially when we are away from our clients. During the pandemic, we were not allowed to go into any sites here at ASU, but I still had a class that needed to work with participants and all of our older adults were so isolated and so just getting into a space where we could start doing a lot of 
virtual work and that opened up for me the space of access. Um, and so I'm gonna slightly share about a partnership I had with Musical Instrument Museum here where we would do these um, gallery visits to the museum and then half music therapy session. And it's on the north side of Phoenix. So it's usually just who can ever get there. Um, if you have a facility, they're gonna bring a bus of about 14 people. And when the pandemic happened, we were able to start doing these virtually and just the access to the demographics of older adults that could now engage in these resources that were free simply because they no longer had to drive to the location. So I'm excited to get into more dialogue about how it looks to partner, how we get to share what we might be needing as music therapists in some of these apps that we build out and technology that we build out. So thanks. That's great. Thank you for sharing. So as you were describing these uh, experiences, kind of one thing that stood out to me is that human interaction. So they're going to a museum, there are people there, uh, you're working with a therapist, there is somebody else there, and we just kind of know from neuroscience and, and kind of social relationship are important. So I guess I would like to pose this question to the panel and, and Frank and Ed, maybe because you're working with the specific population, you can answer of, what are the limitation of using an app-based technology? So you are at home, you're an elderly, you have a grandparent and you're given a device, an iPad or the, the glasses that you um, described at. And does that have any limitation around like the person who's feeling lonely and not being able to interact via music with somebody else? And how do we address that? Whoever would like to go first. Frank, you wanna go or? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly acknowledge that, you know, music is, is a very human activity and it's it's going to be best practice with a human involved. Uh, uh, that sort of prefaces anything else I have to say. But um, there are ways of using technology to dynamically respond to the, uh, the client. Um, so, you know, we're using the camera and microphone, for example, in order to read uh, the extent to which the participant, or I, I, we keep using different terms, client, participant, customer. <laughs> so uh, to read the extent to which they are absorbed by the music, to also get a read on what is their emotional response right now. And that's actually going to influence the next uh, track of music that they hear. So there is something dynamic going on. Um, and there's reinforcement learning that takes place through the use of AI. So, you know, it happens in the moment, but it also happens over time. So uh, we can learn about the patterns, uh, what particular emotional sequences work for, for a client in bringing them to their desired goal state. That's something that, uh, you know, in some ways technology might have an advantage. Um, but again, ultimately, uh, I, I, th I think the way to think about this is that music is a human activity. It's best done with a human. And, uh, you know, I like this dialogue of how can these technologies complement what music therapists and other types of therapists are doing. So, um, you know, I, I'll just give you some very quick examples beyond music therapy. So uh, currently we're, we're looking at uh, working with psychotherapists, audiologists, spe speech language pathologists, and, you know, they all have their own practices, but uh, a psychotherapist might be working with a client on CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, or mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. They'll give the client homework to do, and uh, that, that homework is essential to the objectives of the therapy. Uh, music-based digital therapy fits in very nicely. So if we can use music to, to create this mindful state or move towards calm on a regular basis, and the music is reinforcing, this is fantastic because it's something that people can practice every day. Um, um, in audiology, uh, 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 tinnitus is a common reason for prescribing hearing aids. It's, it's not just hearing loss. Uh, again, uh, a music-based digital therapy can support tinnitus alongside of a hearing aid. Uh, a speech-language pathologist uh, may provide a singing, singing intervention for a particular client, let's say post-stroke aphasia, and there's some real opportunities for supporting that practice at home in a meaningful way using a, a dy dynamic AI-based technology. 
you. Ed, would you like to add to that? Um, sure. I mean, you know, we would like um, with our um, Synchrony Gamma technology to, you know, be able to curate an individual user experience um, like Frank speaks of and Matt. Um, but I, I wanted to um, point out, you know, one thing that we think about a lot is how do we integrate with music therapists? So, for example, this technology that we use to synchronize light to the music, it works in real time. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a microphone uh, in those glasses so that when the uh, when the patient does have the opportunity of working with a music therapist, they can still use our therapy to get that little supplemental benefit of, you know, synchronizing specific brain rhythms at specific frequencies. So um, and we've you know, we've actually uh, done some uh, testing of this at, at Wartburg uh, facility um, in New York. Um, and we've worked with a number of music therapists to do this. And um, it seems that the patients, you know, like it a lot. So, and, you know, um, you know, I've been in a number of music therapy sessions at this point in my journey. And um, I really just enjoy seeing that interaction, that human to human interaction. And we don't want to take it away. You know, we would like to, um, I don't know, supplement it maybe, um, you know, try to try to strengthen that um, uh, that the effect of that music therapy, um, without being too, you know, without getting in the way too much. Right. So I want to uh, ask, ask a couple of the questions from our audience, but before we get there, Matt, I would love to hear uh, your perspective as, you know, Spotify really is, I think, largely designed to be independent of a human curator, as you were describing, even in its AI tools, um, so how do you, how do you, what do you, how do you think about the limitations that Spotify might be coming up against in the context of this conversation? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I definitely echo, um, both Melita and Ed that the kind of human in the loop is really, really important. And I don't think that, I don't think anyone here is wanting to replace music therapy or any type of therapy for that matter. Um, one thing the so I mean, I can talk kind of generally about the social component of music listening and the benefits that usually go along with that and the efforts that Spotify is doing for that. There's jam sessions, so ways to like co-curate a playlist together, which have been around for a little. And now there's like a new version of it where you can kind of co like co-create a cue on a single speaker, which is again not so much specifically therapeutic, but more general about how I think the efforts to try to make this more of a social experience. But I think my general kind of thoughts around um, the kind of their the human perspective of therapy would be that I think there's a real opportunity with music therapy or just maybe therapy in general to use music from a, that's a particularly important to a listener or that's particularly meaningful or particularly emotional and actively explore that with a therapist in a room with a therapist. That's a type of music therapy I haven't actually seen done too much. And Spotify can implement that or augment that in a lot of ways. One is just obviously it has all the music so it can play it. The other would be knowing what's important or what's meaningful to a user. There's nostalgia based playlists. There's, you can look back at your listening history for like a particular moment when you listen to something. And I think there's an opportunity for like a co-listening with a therapist where you, <laughs> yeah, maybe you've already done this actually, but yeah, co-listening with a therapist based on some piece of music that's really important, actively exploring what it means to you, your feelings, your thoughts. Um, again, this hasn't been done, but I think it's a way in which the data that Spotify has about your listening history can help augment the type of therapy. So, so Melita, are you going to be sending Matt a bunch of emails <laughs> about... I and because I was just going to, if I can, say how I didn't use it on Spotify because it was pre-Spotify time. But um, I was, I had a patient that I was seeing in the hospital and we were doing heartbeat recordings. And um, we were recording the heartbeat and then that would become the drumbeat of their favorite song that I would sing. And then I would send it to their family as a bereavement gift. Um, and a lot of music therapists practice this in a lot of wow. spaces. 
And um, what was really cool for this individual was that he was not from here. And we did a lot of songwriting around this, um, around the song that was his favorite selected song. And he had served in the military in his home country and he had traveled a lot. So after we were done with the songwriting experience, he's like, can you pull up a song for me? And he started asking me to pull up all these different songs in all different languages. And I was like, wait a minute, do you know that there is an app that you can mm -hmm. use radio stations from around the world? And so mm -hmm. he was able to, when I, I kind of showed him and his wife how to use it, and um, you know, Arizona is very hot. So like you, it was summer, you're not leaving your hospital room very much. They weren't from here. And I got the most loveliest note from the wife after the session saying, you really helped change our day around, not just for the intervention that you were there, you allowed us to transport and leave this room because we were able to go around the country and around the world listening to radio stations and recalling music, right? And so again, if you were to then take that 10 times forward with Spotify, um, would be amazing. And when I used to run my intergenerational rock ensemble, yes, we would perform the music live, but there is something about older adults needing to hear the song from the 70s in its original um, state. And what happened is we did music from the 70s to that year. So we did Bruno Mars, we did Taylor Swift, and it also allowed them to start communicating with their adult children and their grandchildren about music preference and what they like and learning new things. And right, so if you've got a thing that's going to then give you suggestions to five more artists, now here's this music communication that's going on outside of the therapeutic environment that's increasing their quality of life every day. So I'm again, that's excited. Yeah, I think that's one of the um, kind of maybe underappreciated values of music is that it it can serve as a starting point for a conversation and many other interactions that um, themselves can you know be healing and helpful. Um, so to that uh, in that vein, Jeff from our audience is asking specifically about people with various neurodivergences, and I know that that's a big area of work for music therapists to you know help, uh, especially people who perhaps have trouble communicating um, on the autism spectrum, et cetera. Uh, that you know they can they can sort of learn and and develop some of those skills through music. Um, I don't know, uh, Frank or Ed, is that, are, are those populations something that your particular companies are thinking about targeting? Um, or Matt, do you want to jump in at whether Spotify has like a playlist that maybe is for people who are known to have ADHD or dyslexia and sort of how, how are we working through the whole neurodiversity issue? Frank? No. No, we are we are working in uh, neurogenic and neurodegenerative diseases, but not uh, neurodiversity. It's not on on the front burner, uh, so I'm all ears. Right. So yeah. So the next thing uh, coming for us is Parkinson's disease because that also is is a you know very rhythm uh, a, a disease that's based on you know hypersynchrony in this case brain rhythms, but. Um, you know, there are um, many neurodivergences that are associated with um, uh, differences in brain rhythms. And, and um, for example, ADHD, or sorry, uh, autism is one of them. And um, in fact, you know, it's not got anything to do with the company at the moment, but I did bring in a student who is uh, interested in um, autism spectrum disorder and looking at music. So, you know, it's something that may come eventually, I think. Um, but, you know, sort of one thing at a time, I guess. I can add a little bit of information, not so much through the Spotify lens, as much as just some work I've done previously. Um, I consulted briefly for a company that was developing music for focus and one of the kind of using binaural beats type uh, versions of that technology or a version of it. And we mostly the idea was to look at like focus-based tasks in groups that were high or low in um, ADHD disorders, or sorry, uh, symptoms. So it wasn't diagnosable, but it was a very important uh, covariate that we were looking at. And then in terms of autism spectrum disorder, again, in my, in previous work actually at USC and, and just from the research that we, um, the background research we did, we know that while emotional deficits in facial recognition might be a feature of ASD, it appears that recognizing the emotions of music doesn't seem to be as much of a deficit. So there's definitely a possibility that 
uh, music and, and the emotional aspects of music could be used. Uh, and in general, there's uh, some in indication that autism spectrum disorder, um, there's a lot of musical um, advantages or developmental um yeah, they, they tend to be, they can be quite musical as well. So there's a way to pay, possibly use that as a way to kind of relearn these emotional deficits. I mean, in a second, I want to get back to some of the ways in which therapist-led and music-based apps uh, can can collaborate and, and sort of well, how do we think about this in the future? But just two quick kind of uh, practical questions from our audience members. Beth, who's a, who's a music therapist, has said that a lot of the apps that she's used or or uh, technologies have limited music libraries, um, which of course is a big, at least up, up until now, licensing music has been a big barrier to developing these libraries. Um, and so I wonder if you can, she now uses Spotify, but I wonder if, if Frank or Ed, you could talk about, uh, are these issues that you have had to come up against or have we moved to a model where we essentially Spotify solve that problem to some extent, <laughs> um, you know, in the news and through lots of controversy, but, um, you know, where are we with this limited library problem? I mean, as, as, a, as a small startup company, absolutely, you have to deal with that. Um, so we have to think about now already, even as we are doing our clinical trials, where's our music going to come from? Who are we going to partner with to license our music and so forth? So it's absolutely something you need to think about. And you know, for for a system like ours, we want we want to make all the music of the world, you know, available to our um, patients. You know, so maybe that means at some point partnering with a Spotify. But we're not actually quite there yet. But but we know we have to think about it. We have talked to a couple of different companies about it. We're also exploring the, the legalities and commercial opportunities. But in, in our uh, recent trials, we've, uh, we have opened up the window and, and we're using, um, we're using uh, uh, really all of the music uh, to look at the potential efficacy uh, of the system. But the, the commercial and legal aspects are, um, you know, in our sites, uh, barriers for us to, uh, to deal with. Yeah, in our um, longitudinal studies, we we actually in one of them we just you know give the uh, patients an Alexa, and we just sort of plug it into our device, and that you know uh, activates the uh, the uh, synchronized lighting. Great. So I think you're kind of like touching base on this integration and working together, and how we can bring a bring music therapy to app based and technology based. So I want to go back to Melinda and since you are representing the entire field of music therapy, <laughs> um, could you tell us like, what are your, what are the desires of the field? Like what is the best way that the technology environment and, and these, um, the colleagues that we have here and kind of many more who are working in this place um, can integrate with music therapy? What, what is your ask and how you can uh, come together? Yeah, so I think, way more conversations like this, you know, is, is really good. Um, everyone's going to have a different need for what they need their app to do. Um, I will say for me, so I'll speak for myself and the whole community of music therapy. You know, I'll speak for myself and say, um, you know, sometimes when I'm using apps, I am or in technology, I am wanting something that's just grassroots can it play the instrument for me right like can I mimic the space of playing a piano or a guitar um when I'm getting into music listening experiences then I want to have the flexibility of um not can I just get the music but then as a therapist can is there some homework experiences or spaces for connections that we can communicate through that app and I can see what you're using and you can share with me so I think some of that space of therapist user connection. Um, so those are so those are some of the things that I'm thinking about is just, you know, is it a receptive experience where the participants listening to music, are they sharing that out? Or is there some sort of active engagement with the um, app that we want there? And I think an app that can do multiple things would be really beautiful because we haven't been having as much success with that yet. Yeah, maybe there's a model in which, um, you know, when a therapist is using Spotify in a session, for example, they have access to elements that most users do not uh, because it can help them either pick the next song or, or you know, use the data existing of that individual's playlist history 
um, access that, you know, maybe there's a, a, a way of of creating a kind of uh, lens into some of these tools that is specific to the needs of the music therapist in the moment. Yes, and definitely something that lends to the flexibility in the moment so that we can change as the client is changing would be really, really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And I think posing the same question to like Frank and Ed and Matt, also feel free, like, what is your ask from the music therapy um, group and, and colleagues? Of, are you currently working with music therapists in, in developing your app? Um, I know Spotify is not necessarily developing an app with the therapy, but um, how, is, how do you see the inclusion of, of the professionals in, in this group in, in the development and kind of um, broadening the usage of that? We are currently working with a number of therapists uh, in our uh, sort of phase one clinical trial. Uh, in fact, our protocol involves um, patients working with a music therapist to develop an initial playlist that they start with. Um, and, you know, so um, we we also, I talk to music therapists a lot and, and try to um, get ideas and, you know, for innovative ways to use music uh, to help people. Um, so I think that's also really important. So, you know, some of these ideas that Melita um, was talking about earlier about these innovative ways to interact with people, you know, whether it's with their heartbeat or, you know, something else. I think that's, um, you know, that there's a lot of potential there for innovative new ideas, right? Um, you know, we try to uh, sort of take music and then go back to neuroscience and, and see if we could put the two together. Um, but we also love to work with music therapists and, and we do so all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We're also uh, regularly talking to music therapists, consulting with them in order to uh, develop new, new ways to do this. Um, the other type of therapy that we're, you know, we're, we're just now um starting to implement is, is that we're working with psychotherapists or people uh, uh, people engaging in cognitive behavioral therapy. So as I was alluding to earlier, um, there's often homework to do in in specifically mindfulness based CBT and it's a it's a great target for anxiety and anxiety related disorders. Music fits in very nicely. And uh, so what we have are some protocolized uh, uses of our music intervention uh, that can be uh, prescribed by the therapist. So that's, you know, we'll see where all that goes. We're, we're really in a pilot phase at this point, uh, but I'm quite optimistic about the possibility of supporting that kind of therapy with, with our digitally based music therapy. Uh, and I should mention that our therapy uses uh, the binaural beats that that uh, Matt was referring to. It's a, so it's another form of entraining the brain. Great, thank you. And, and Matt, I know that we talked about that Spotify doesn't have a therapeutic goal in mind, but obviously that you are working for them, you're coming from a neuroscience perspective of really valuing personality, empathy profiles, um, kind of cultural background of music and selection of music. So your knowledge and expertise goes into personalization of these playlists. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So yeah, as you alluded to, my kind of previous work before Spotify was a lot of trying to understand how music induces emotions and what are the factors that influence it. So one of the focuses of my research was on why certain people gain psychological benefits from things like sad music and others don't. And there appears to be, so there are t tons of psychological benefits, um, some relating to kind of um, understanding a complex feeling or kind of gaining the benefits that sadness can bring without being bogged down in the usual social media that might cause it like a death. So you can kind of gain those same benefits that come from being um, depressively realistic, as some people say, or some other benefits without actually being sad and sad music can provide that. Some others are that it allows you to kind of release negative emotions or go deeper into them to purge them. And those different psychological benefits appear to be associated with different personality traits. So one is kind of more of this, as I saw alluded to, empathic traits of like empathy of a specific type of empathy called like absorption or fantasy, where you 
become absorbed into characters or situations and movies and music that's been linked to this enjoyment of sad music through this kind of more um, understanding another person and feeling connected uh, psychological benefit. Whereas something like rumination still can gain benefits for sad music kind of by kind of like going through and purging these negative emotions. So that's kind of the previous research. At, at Spotify, we're not really doing any sort of incorporation with that, though I sure would like to. Um, and I, I do think these things will always need human oversight or, or the kind of insights from music therapy. But if we can get more of this information on a user, so one of the big pushes I'm trying to um, see if we can do is allow for much more user feedback or listener feedback, which we do not have at all. Mostly we're trying to guess and rather than guess, why don't we just ask people to tell us? So this can take a variety of forms. One can be, I don't want this right now, or this is what I'm looking for right now. Give me that. Another can be kind of tagging emotion, uh, music as you're listening to it with how you're feeling. So we pilot a couple different things where like you maybe as the music is going, you can tell us how you're feeling and then we can either give you more of that or not. Um, but then the other would be, you know, more in general to the question that Asal was maybe asking is, can we get a sense of other kind of demographic information about the person? So we know country and we know, um, we actually don't know much more than country. A lot of that data is very, very protected, but we kind of know general location where like IP addresses could be. So is there a way to incorporate that into what we personalize for a person? So like what's trending or what's popular in your area? Or what are your friends listening to? Things like that. Um, in terms of personality measures, that's also maybe something we could explore, though probably has a lot of data privacy issues and would be a little bit difficult to incorporate. But again, kind of, the general approach of asking people more about what they want and who they are, uh, we think it can really improve the way that we um, give music to people at the right time. I want to get back to this kind of global nature of music and how, you know, we need to not be U.S. centric uh, since there's, of course, many other kinds of, of music that is, that is listened to and used in many different ways outside of the U.S. Um, but just a couple of practical questions that have come up in the chat um, one question is about who is funding the clinical trials. So um, just if you're interested in applying for NIH funding, there is uh, uh, there there are uh, certain requests for proposals that are that are out and are coming out that could be appropriate. You can find more about those at soundhealth.ucsf.edu under funding. Um, we do list uh, those and then we have partnerships with the NIH to do workshops to help people develop good proposals. Um, but that that is like I think a question for Ed and, and Frank, you know, who's funding the work that you're doing within these companies? Is it VC? Is it the NIH? Um, you know, who's who's paying for the the um, the trials? And then the secondary question is, and what are you measuring? Like, what are your outcome measures then um, as you're looking at the efficacy of these interventions? So um, we funded our, our first exploratory trial was funded by the National Science Foundation. They actually have a really wonderful small business uh, program. Um, if anyone out there is thinking of you know starting a company, I would um, talk to them. Um, our our current um, longitudinal study is being funded by NIH, um, and we're uh, currently you know uh, looking at applying to NIH for more money. But when we get to our you know, pre-pivotal clinical trial, that's going to be VC funded. In fact, we're raising money for that now. So right. I think that's really sometimes helpful. It's to just too big. That. Yeah. Sometimes it's just too big yeah, of an ask for the NIH even. Yeah. So you start with like an SBIR or an NSF kind of small business grant to get you going. You collect some pilot data that makes you competitive for an NIH grant. You get the NIH grant to collect more data. And then when you're ready to bring to market, that's when you bring in the VCs for the, the, the really big money. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar trajectory for us. We, we, we are uh, Canada based. And, and so we've uh, received a, a, a good amount of money from our equivalent of the NSF in uh, the development of our our product. In terms of the research, uh, the research has been supported uh, by VCs, and uh, for the foreseeable future, it will be a mix of VC funding and public funding. 
And what about the outcomes? So given that, you know, there are different outcomes probably for a small business grant versus what the NIH is looking for versus what the VCs are going to be watching for. So how do you measure the success of these programs? Well, so if you're targeting a specific disease like we are, um, there are pretty much, you know, uh, standards that you have to measure, you know. So for um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, we need to measure memory and cognition. Um, and there are, you know, very standard ways of doing that. Um, but we also want to measure things like hippocampal atrophy, for example. So um, so they're, they're imaging measures. And um, EEG is one of our outcome measures always. So... Um, you know, if you're targeting, I guess I would say if you're targeting a specific disease, you know, you're going to want to, there will be um, measures that you have to use. Um, so that's what we do. Yeah, yeah we, we try to use the, the the clinical standard measures. So if it's anxiety, we, we are using the STIXA, it's a state trait anxiety inventory. If it's uh, agitation and dementia, it's uh, uh, the Cohen-Mansfield Agitation Index or a state index of agitation. These are the gold standards that pharma trials are measured against. So we need to use the same outcomes. Uh, we are also looking at, uh, in our more lab-based work, we're looking at EEG outcomes related and cortisol outcomes related to anxiety. So Melita, I have a couple questions for you. Um, one, Susan Tilbury says hello <laughs> in the chat. Um, and the other oh, gosh, is, <laughs> um, is about, uh, in, in regards to music therapy, one, uh, Jess uh, Rushing is asking, what is the most helpful or desired from technology developers? Um, what do they need to consider from music therapists when collaborating? And I wonder actually if I, I'd like to ask Melita your thoughts on that first. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the kinds of outcomes that you measure as a music therapist and what you think um, might be helpful for, for tech and developers to know. And then we can ask the developer this himself. Yeah. yeah. So again, hello, Susan. <laughs> That's great of the connection with Ed now. That's awesome. I could just jump in. Susan is my current student. She shared in the chat. She She's was sitting in the other life. room. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. That is so awesome. And she has been part of some of the projects that I've talked about with the lifelong learning. Um, so what's really great is we have a lot of the same outcomes. <laughs> we're, using, we're talking about a lot of the same measures. When we're talking about research, those are some of the same gold standards that we would be accessing. We'd be accessing the NIH toolkit and the measures out of there, whether it was patient reported um, or something else. So, so that's really a good thing that we have. A, I think we have a, a more of a common language than people probably think we do. Um, and then especially for the partners on the team today, because you are working with a lot of music therapists, you, you are knowing some of that language. Um, and then I think from us hearing what you're, what you're doing, where you're going, that helps um, connect to us, even if it's not music therapy. I think it sparks interest. Because something I was thinking from uh, Frank that you said earlier, when you were working with psychotherapists and CBT and giving them homework on mindfulness, um, some of the early studies in music therapy in which people were using technology, especially with older adults with dementia, and giving it to caregivers in the home or paid caregivers in facilities to work on things like sleep disturbances and disruptive behaviors. Um, those early trials were set with just giving the technology and no music therapy oversight. And so over time, it really seemed like for family members, it just became one more thing. They really needed a little more training. They needed the therapist to be able to be with them all the time, but that's not the way the study was set up. So just being able to learn like, okay, what are advances and things and protocols that are working for y'all that we could implement in music therapy as well when we want to give homework to patients because homework for patients is a big thing. Um, something that they can be doing when they are um, not with us. So I think just more communication, knowing what our common language is and what y'all are doing and help spark ideas for us on things that we could need and needs we might have. And Matt, do you want to comment on what, what developers of these apps um, might be looking for from music therapists? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of what the models we build um, require data curators to classify music or tell us which 
words or tags are most representative or editors as well. And those those people are have kind of like immeasurable skills. They just a lot of the editors, it's kind of like a vibe thing or the, the data curators have kind of like tax, you know how to taxonomy things and put them in the categories. And I think the same principles could apply for music therapy. So knowing, like I've asked the editors here, actually before this conversation, we have a couple of playlists that editors make that are kind of geared towards these things like anti-anxiety or calming or I've asked them, do you spot check this with people or music therapists or anyone and they're like not really it's just kind of a vibe thing or you know like that we have um I think it's called like mood lift right and I was like do you actually have this lift mood in people and they're like no it's like a vibe so I, I do think there's like an opportunity there if they wanted or if people if they really want to go in that direction to have kind of that as another human in the loop a, a music therapist or even just like listeners tell us is this really impacting your mood if I could just jump in really quick, we're currently using music therapists as our sort of curators for everybody's playlist and to check in every week and help them pick other songs and so forth. Yeah, I think a, a related question, maybe Frank, you can speak of that, that Brooke is asking how often would the app take into account measuring the progress of, of the user? So um, I know that you talked a little bit about the AI driven nature of the app, but maybe you can speak a bit more of that. Yeah, there, there are regular online measures of the outcome that come from the use of the camera and the mic in our in our case. So again, we're reading emotion and absorption from our users. And uh, so that's a kind of check-in. So you can imagine that over, over time, we can get a sense of how positive or negative someone's mood is. Um, but then we also have check-ins that we do in, in our clinical trials that um, they can be as frequent as once every session, so a before and an after. But I think, I think in terms of a real-world use, that's not the best way to go. That's just too demanding for a client. Um, so uh, the right kind of cadence for this is probably somewhere closer to a week to, to link together our dynamic measures with our more clinical measures, uh, you know, and then ultimately what we want to be able to do is predict those clinical measures from our online dynamic measures. And that's, that's part of the machine learning objectives that we have. Wonderful. It's one more quick question, and maybe this um, to, to add, um, um, somebody's asking, uh, were there any innovation in motor skill targeted apps? And, and you talked about Parkinson's and rhythm. So do you also um, target as one outcome development or improvement of motor skills? Um, we're not currently doing that, but we're, but we're currently developing uh, developing our um, skills in, in Parkinson's. So um, the, the point there is to desynchronize rhythms in the beta frequency band, which is a little bit lower than gamma, but higher than theta or alpha. And um, we're we're trying to find uh, ways that we can uh, bring music into that process. I mean, music is already pretty good at helping people move just on its own. Uh, people have Parkinson's disease, but um, you know, uh, there are there are some um, really innovative uh, uh, neuroscientists out there who are um, finding ways to target specifically uh, beta frequencies in those in those right parts of the brain, and we're trying to think if we can bring music into that process. Yeah. And of course, there's a whole cottage industry of helping people learn to play a musical instrument that involves that kind of motor skill learning and even other, you know, transferring to other um, dexterity skills like typing and so on. So that's that's uh, a conversation perhaps for another panel uh, as we've, we're running short on time and I'm going to uh, do my best to kind of give us a quick summary of, of what we've been talking about. Uh, it's really exciting to see these very specific companies that are coming up uh, around these specific tools um, with particular populations of patients or uh, clients in mind. And it's exciting to hear from Spotify that there is this, at least there is a understanding of the impact that mu music can have on mood. Um, but one of the greatest benefits that Spotify has provided, I think, this space 
is this unlimited music library, this access to radio stations from around the world? Um, because we know music is highly personal. It, it is important that you um, really titrate the, you know, personalize the prescription to the person. Um, and that is what music therapy, the whole field has been built on for 50 or 60 years. That's why we call it music therapy, where it's got this one-to-one -one relationship with the client and their changing needs. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you, all of you, uh, for, for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Asal, for this idea and all of the hard work that you've done to bring us together. Uh, this panel will be archived on the Sound Health Network's YouTube channel. And uh, we encourage you also to see some of our other resources. For example, we have a clearinghouse at soundhealth.ucsf.edu. And in preparation for this panel, we have uh, put some of the publications from the labs of all of these individuals into the clearinghouse um, so that you know, people can get a sense of, of what the research is out there. And of course, we have funding opportunities. So thank you all. Um, it's great to see you. And obviously, we have a bright future of work ahead of us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.